This is an example of a race condition in Python and how we can solve it. So a race condition is when you have multiple threads that are running within a program and they interact in a way with results that you don't want. So basically one thread does something out of order or multiple threads do things out of order. So you can see that in this little example I've got here. So what I've got is I've created two threads a thread or my thread one and my thread two and I run both of these threads at the same time so what's happening is in both cases I sleep for a random amount of time so I'm going to sleep for uh, between 0 and 10 seconds so it sleeps there and then it prints out that it should finish first and in the second thread it does exactly the same thing apart from it says it should finish last so you've got to imagine that there's some dependencies between these two threads. That means that this one has to finish first, always, and this one always has to finish last. And the sleep here is just simulating an amount of processing that's happening. So there are different amounts of processing that can happen between these two. So if we look at how this will execute. So we have our process space and what we're going to do is create our m1 thread and our m2 thread so these are just variables kind of created down here create the m1 create the m2 and start them so in our process space this thing we create our m1 we create our m2 and then they start to run so what's going to happen is they start to execute in fact, they will both start to execute at the same time. They'll both run at the same time. And then they will both print out thread 1 sleeping and then thread 2 sleeping. And in most cases, it's going to print out in that order, just because this thread starts first and this thread starts second. And that's the first thing it ever does. So it's, it's possible that they could print out thread 2 first and then thread 1. But in most cases, what's going to happen is it's going to print out thread 1 sleeping, thread 2 sleeping. So, what we get is a little bit of output in each case. Now, we then sleep for an amount of time. So, in the best case, what happens is that thread 1 sleeps for a short amount of time and then prints out, and thread 2 sleeps for a longer amount of time and then prints out. So, what that means is that thread 1 has finished first and then thread 2 has finished but because this time and this time are random in this case it just basically saying we can't order them it's entirely possible that thread M2 will take a short amount of time and thread M1 would take a longer amount of time so if we look what that would look like so I will just kind of draw a line across and we'll do a, a new M1 and a new M2. So M1 would come down and then print and the same would happen there. But now M2 sleeps for a short amount of time and prints and M2 sleeps for a longer amount of time and then prints. So we've ended up rearranging the order. So in this case M2 is finished and M1 has carried on, which means we've printed out I should finish last first, and we should finish first last. So this is how we want it to look, but this is how it could end up. So we can end up with things doing happening in the wrong order, and in the worst case that can cause your program to crash. For example, if thread 1 was calculating something that thread 2 then needed. If thread 2 was ready for that input but thread 1 hadn't it could end up uh, using junk input and just crash and fail so we need to do something to actually fix this problem so the the way we can deal with this is what we call a mutex so what a mutex is it's a mutual exclusion it allows us to lock a running thread and make it stop for a while and wait for another one so if I draw my process space again and I can show you what I want to happen. 
So I've got my process M1 and my process M2. So what we want to happen is M1 to start and then give our output, M2 to start and then give our output. <coughs> Excuse me. And then what we want to happen is M1 can continue up until the point that it's about to finish, or it's about to do the thing that requires M1. And once that happens, what we want is we want it to lock. So I'm attempting to draw a little door there. So that means that M2 can't continue. So this thing is our mutex. It is our lock. So that means that we have to wait. So then what we want to happen is M1 to carry on. And M1 can do its output. And then, after it's done its output, it's going to unlock our mutex. So I'm going to draw a very bad key. There we go, a very bad key. So, we now unlock our mutex, which means our mutex is no longer there. And then M2 can continue, and it can print out. So what that means is, or the implication of that, is that M2, no matter how long this piece takes, or technically this piece takes, up until it's printed out and up until it's locked, it will wait for M1. It will wait until M1's done the output. So let's have a look at the code for that. So here's what it looks like. So it's a little bit bigger, but not much has really changed. So the majority of it is the same. So I'll just do some little highlights to show you where it's changed. So that's different, that's different, there, 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 and there. So I won't reiterate what the program actually does again, because it's exactly the same as before. But what we do have is we create our mutex object, our object that we can lock, so we can use this to acquire locks and to remove locks from things in both thread 1 and thread 2 I'm going to refer to the global variable of this lock um, just so we can talk about the same object, so we can talk about the same thing. In thread 1 I've... in fact I'll actually talk a little bit further down. Once we start our program we actually lock the mutex. So the first thing we've got is the mutex locked and Nothing can use it at this point. We have to release it before we can carry on. So the door to M2 is locked and it can't continue. So then what happens is we run our thread 1 and we run our thread 2, just kind of the same there and there. We do our thread 1 print, we sleep for a little while, we finish and then we release the lock. So after thread 1 has finished its execution, it can release its lock, and that means that we can let thread 2 continue. So the thread 2, again what we have is global to the lock, so we can actually talk about the same object. Then it prints out, it does its random amount of processing, whatever that's going to be, and here it attempts to acquire the lock. So it attempts to say, I am the only person that can be doing this. So I am the only person that can print out. What happens is, this line we wait at. So we wait here until the lock has been released. So, we can only have one lock at a time on a mutex, and no more. Which means that only, if that's locked here, if we lock it at this point, then we have to wait here. So we can do lock, acquire, release and then acquire again. So if we haven't released it then it's going to stay here and wait. So we enter thread 2, thread 2 waits here until we release. So this is our locked door waiting for us to open it. And then when thread 2 comes around does the release and unacquires the lock, releases the lock 
and we can print out I can finish last. So what happens is in our thread space we have our M1, we have our M2, our threads start and they both print out a little message. Thread 1 prints out, thread 1 sleeping, thread 2 prints out, thread 2 sleeping. Then they both wait a random amount of time, but as thread one, sorry, as thread two waits, it then gets locked. It then has to wait until thread two finish. So until thread one finishes, thread M one comes down, prints out, and then uses our little key, our release, in order to unlock. The mutex here and this can continue and then print. So in that case we can order our threads, we can make sure that thread M1 always finishes before M2. Basically we can make sure that two pieces of code will not interact with each other. 